Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. I had the privilege several years ago of teaching both of these men seated over here, and they taught me a lot more than I probably taught them. But I've always admired Brother Carl McLaughlin. He was our youth man for the Dallas Metroplex area. His wife is a student here at Bible College. I've always admired their walk with God. Great testimony, if you've ever heard Brother Carl's testimony. Great man of God, great preacher, used effectively. And in praying about it, I, I just felt such a strong feeling from the Lord that he needed to step behind this pulpit and address this congregation that's gathered here today. Would you make welcome, Brother Carl McLaughlin? Now let's put our hands together loudly to the Lord Jesus Christ. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all your land. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good. When you're walking in the valley, he's still good. When you're financially broke, he's still good. When you don't know where a miracle is, he's still good. Because he's the Alpha and he is the Omega. He knows the ending from the very beginning. And he's in this house tonight. Oh, let's put our hands together. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Now, I know, I know, I was here in Bible college. So, I know you will watch carefully every word I say. Amen, and I'm glad of that. I'm glad of that. I tell you what, Brother Gurley, I'm honored to be here. Amen. The reason I've said that is because I know I said you're glad to be here tonight. Amen. Hey, I'm happy to be with each and every one of you, and I just want to say, I don't want to take long. It's already 10 after 12 according to that clock. But I come to you today not as an outsider trying to somehow find where you're at, but knowing whether you're a junior or senior in high school, knowing the anticipation, the anxiety of an uncertain future. Whether you're a freshman, a junior, or a senior, and you know that the clothes and the curtain will be closed of this school year and this next door has yet to open I know that feeling I know that feeling and so I want to with a burden in my heart minister the word of the Lord to you I want to say to brother Gurley thank you so much it's an honor to be here to all the faculty and the staff of Texas Bible College I appreciate greatly the work of the Lord that is being done here as a student of Texas Bible College in 1993-93. We had junior senior days and never had a turnout like you have today. And I understand that everything rises and falls with leadership. I know it's because of a perpetual burden by leadership that there is such a good turnout today. And I want to welcome each and every one of you. We're glad that you have chosen to visit Texas Bible College today. Amen. I'm glad to be with a good, good, good friend of mine, Brother Monso. And I think that his wife will be here shortly. He and Cade. And I am thankful to be here also with many of other my friends. And, of course, I am so thankful that my wife is here with me. Life is six months into a pregnancy. We went to the doctor this past week and found out that we're having a little baby.
baby boy. Amen. Amen. And so early, early this morning, I, I awoke before the wake-up call came, and I, I, I rolled over and put my arm around my wife and placed it upon my baby's womb, her stomach. And I just sat there for a moment. It was like I just felt a little kick from John Michael. And he was saying, Daddy, I'm already up and I'm ready to go preach with you. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I'm ready to preach the word of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. A little inspiration there in the early morning. Amen. God bless you. I want you to turn today, if you will, to the book of Genesis, chapter 12. Now, uh, there's so many, so many comments that I acknowledge and the things that transpired in my life. It completely changed my life. It completely changed my life. And I'm thankful for Texas Bible College. Amen. I do not know where I'd be without Texas Bible College. Amen. I want to preach to you today from Genesis chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out. I want to preach to you today from this thought. Two titles, if I could use that. Number one, simply get thee out. Or number two, when security become uncertainty. Amen. When God calls you from a place of security and stability and comfort to an uncertain future. Let's lift our hands to the Lord today and worship Him. Amen. God of heaven, have your way in this place today. Jesus, I'm seeking your divine will and your divine counsel in this house. Spirit of the Lord, I'm asking you to penetrate the heart of every person in this place. Future students, present students, preachers of the gospel, Lord, let an anointing light upon this place today. Lord, I'm asking you to pave the pathway of their future. I'm asking you to move in the Holy Ghost and give divine direction. Divine direction. Divine direction. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord. And you may be seated. Thank you for standing. To leave a place of security and travel into the darkness of uncertainty I find culminated and integrated into the very fabric and into uh, the very place of Abraham's heart. A faith unshakable. A faith unmovable, a faith irrevocable, and a faith invincible. It was at the climactic point of supreme sacrifice uh, that we are all very, very familiar with. That we discover the manhood, uh, we discover the dedication, and we discover the consecration of this man uh, called Abraham. You see, it was on a lone mountaintop uh, in the land of Moriah that is revealed what I find to be uh, the six ingredients that are essential in a successful ministry. As they began their travel up this rough terrain, they found that it was very rugged. They found that it was rigid and that it was very rocky, which created a resistance toward the sacrifice that they were about to give to God. 
You see, when you're about to make sacrifice in your life, uh, you will always find the manifestation of rocks and stones, uh, of resistance to keep you from getting to the place uh, that God wants you to be. But I find in the life of Abraham that when he was placed in that pressured situation, the best always comes out in people when they feel the heat of trials and they feel the heat of tribulation. And so he felt this. And the result and the answer to this rocky, rigid road was he just simply smoothed and leveled the ground. Why? Because he had an ingredient in his ministry. You see, he did not want his altar leaning too far to the left. He didn't want his altar leaning too far to the right. When he offered up a sacrifice to God, he wanted it to be balanced. He wanted it to be level. He wanted God to accept it. You see, I find that he was a man of balance. Amen. He was a man that was leveled. And God liked it. And God said, you are the father of the faithful. Secondly, the second ingredient is that after he had balanced the ground, he laid one stone on top of the other. Amen. In other words, the stone spoke of a rock-solid commitment to ministry. You could not move him from the call of God. Money would not move him from the call of God. Social status would not move him from the call of God. The very life of Abraham was solidified and anchored in the rock of all ages. He was steady. He was secure. And he was very sure in his commitment. He was always the same no matter who he was around. He wasn't like the lizard that changed colors uh, when he got around this group or that group. Uh, why? Because he knew who he believed. Uh, he knew where he was going uh, and he was a rock solid preacher. Yeah. Hey, we don't need the kind of preachers uh, that will be one way here uh, and one way there. We need preachers uh, they're going to anchor in the rock of all ages uh, and say, this is what I am. Uh, I'm a very real person. Uh, if you like it, you like it. Uh, if you don't, you don't. Uh, I'm just here to preach the word of the Lord. Uh, I'm not going to turn. Uh, I'm not going to change. Oh, hallelujah. The third ingredient of his ministry, after he balanced the altar, after he placed one stone on top of the other, then he simply laid the wood on top of the stone. And the Lord said to Jeremiah, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people wood. God himself likened people to wood. And the wood rested on stones of commitment. The people that he would lead rested upon his balanced commitment to God. I said that to say this. If you desire ministry for glamour, if you desire ministry for popularity, if you desire ministry for prestige, amen, when you get behind the scenes, when you remove yourself from the limelight and you get behind the curtains and you're in the everyday battle with flesh and you're in the everyday battle with humanity, if you're not really called for the right reason, people will get on your nerves and people will frustrate Come you. On. But if you love them, if you're committed to them, if you're a balanced man, amen, they will journey to the altar with you and you'll watch them catch on fire. And their problems will burn in defeat while they shine in victory. Don't give up on the backslider. Just lead them to the altar. Don't give up on the lost. Just get them to the altar where they can catch on fire. Don't go 
gossip about them. Just take the wood on your shoulders and say, if you can't walk by yourself, I'm going to carry you to the house of God. I'm going to get you to the altar where you can catch on fire. The fourth ingredient of ministry I find holds me on the side of Abraham. It was the flint that ignited fire in his hands. You see, it is the flint of prayer that's going to send fire from the pulpit to the pew. It is the flint of prayer that is essential in your ministry. It's going to send fire from the instruments to the pew. It is the flint of prayer that's going to send fire from the praise singers to the pew. If you want fire in the pew, there better be fire in the pulpit. And if you want fire in the pulpit, there better be a blazing inferno of fire in the prayer room. Don't get behind the pulpit if you don't have the flint of prayer holstered in your bosom. Hey, you better get behind the pulpit and you better have some prayer in your holster. You better have some prayer that's going to ignite revival in the house of God. We need men of fire. We need men of fervency. Let's clap our hands to the Lord. A prayer life will transform you from depending upon ability to depending upon anointing. Ability caused Saul to lose the ark of God, but anointing caused David to take the ark back. The only way you're going to bring revival back to your church, the only way you're going to bring revival back to the house of God is to have an anointing, a red hot anointing. Oratory ability, musical ability, sounds real, real good to the ear. And it really, really stirs the emotion. But people leave unchanged. People leave still in sin. People leave still out of balance. People leave still undone. Amen and hear me. We are not in this for people to feel good. We're not in this to tickle somebody's ear. No, we're in this uh, to let the liquid fire of anointing burn into the bosom of every heart uh, and break the yoke of sin uh, and break the yoke of bondage. Uh, hey, if revival's not happening, uh, it's not because the people don't have it. Uh, it may be because uh, we need a little bit more anointing. Uh, we need a little bit more fire. And the only place you're going to get that fire is in a prayer room with God. You've got to bury your face in the carpet and don't come out of that prayer room until you're radiating with anointing. It was John Wesley that said, I set myself on fire and the world comes to watch me burn. If nobody preaches with you when you get into the pulpit, set yourself on fire. If nobody worships with you when you get on the keyboard, just set yourself on fire. If nobody's praising with you when they're up here and you're up here singing, just set yourself on fire. Just set yourself on fire. And after a while, the nature of fire spreads. The nature of fire moves. The nature of fire ignites. And the nature of fire touches. Just keep on preaching. Just keep on playing. Just keep on singing. And there will be a fire of revival to get a hold of the carnal heart. We need some fire here today. We need some fire in this house today. Liquid fire. Liquid fire.
necessary inclusion. He did not make unnecessary cuts into the sheep. His work was not messy. His work was not sloppy. His work was precise, and his work was proper. That's because he was still in even tonight. Amen. And to those that are still, God opens the doors. And every man's gift will make room for itself. You don't have to get on the phone and call them. They'll know and God will know who's skilled in the word. Hey, quit worrying about who's going to invite you and who's not. Just get into the prayer room and let the fire burn. Just open up your Bible and study the word of the Lord until you are skilled with the knife. And when you're skilled with the knife, God will open up the door and let you preach. Abraham understood something. And that is the only reason he had the power of the night. Was because God gave him the power of the night. For the purpose of presenting a beautiful sacrifice when God called for it. Future preachers, God does not place the knife of the word of the Lord in your hands to carve up sheep. Amen. I said if he gives you the power of the knife, it's only the purpose for presenting a beautiful sacrifice uh, when that trumpet sounds. He's coming back for a church that's pretty. He's coming back for a church that's proper. He's coming back for a church that's precise. And the only way you're going to learn uh, the skill of the knife uh, is to get yourself uh, into a place of learning uh, and let God carve you uh, into the creature that he wants uh, so that you'll know how to present a church when the rapture happens. that's necessary in ministry is revealed in the moment of desperation. The glistening light which shines in the eyes of us and the blinding shining light calls Isaac to stop. Daddy! Daddy! Where's the sacrifice? ingredients of ministry was revealed when faith spoke. And he said, Isaac, the Lord will provide. And when faith spoke, a miracle came. When faith spoke, Abraham heard something in the background. He heard the struggle going on. He turned to see. He looked into the thicket of thorns. And there was a miracle waiting on him. You see, when you're walking by faith and not by sight, there's a miracle right around the corner. There's a miracle waiting on you. You've got to have the ingredient of faith inside of you and know that God will provide. Now let me speak to somebody that's going through affliction. The thorns of affliction may be the vehicle that is escorting your miracle to your doorstep. Quit griping about the affliction. Quit griping about the valley. Quit griping about the thorns. It's the vehicle. It's the conduit that's transporting and escorting a miracle right in front of your face. Just make up your mind that he is Jehovah Jireh.
came the power, which means the Lord will provide. After my freshman year of Bible college, I had a beautiful offer. Pastor Dan and Nathan to start a conference for Brother Lewis Chapel. Come. He said, if you come and be my youth pastor for this summer, he said, I'll provide you with a place to live. I'll provide you with gas in your vehicle. I'll put groceries in the refrigerator. I'll make sure you have need of nothing, and I'll give you a thousand dollars a month. I said, the doors are open. Immediately, I ran to the prayer room, the telephone in the prayer room. Pastor, pastor, let me tell you about the door that opened up for me. I began to tell my pastor about it. He said, uh, well, for the call, I can't compete with the monetary value that this man is offering you. But I just feel something in the Holy Ghost. I want you to stay home. Didn't offer me a position. Didn't offer me a dollar to sit on the pew and work with the young people. Yes, sir, Pastor. Yes, sir, Pastor. You see, faith works through the channel of command. I said, faith works through the channel of command. It's not faith to move out of the umbrella of protection. It's faith to say, Jesus, I trust you so much that the man of God has heard from you. And I'm going to put myself right underneath the man of God. And I'm not going to move. I said, yes, sir, Pastor. I got in there. Worked 40 hours a week. College my junior year. My pastor called me up one day and he said, Brother Carl, he said, I don't want you to worry about your down payment in the Bible college. He said, We're going to pay your down payment and we're going to give you a shot in the arm. I said, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We got to church. He let me preach the night, the Sunday night before I came back to Bible college my junior year. Before I got up to preach, he said, Church, he said, Brother McLaughlin had an offer to go to a church in McAllen. He gave all the, uh, the money and everything else. And, and he went through all of the story. And he said, now I told him that I wanted him to stay right here and become obedient to me. And he said uh, that Brother McLaughlin was obedient. He said, so I told him that I would give him a shot in the arm and pay his down payment into Bible college. He said, but because he was obedient... He said, I set some extra tithing aside, and we're going to pay for his entire junior year. Hello. I said, thank you, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord shall provide. Don't worry about how you're going to get in next year. You're on the mountain of God, and he is Jehovah Jireh. I said, he is Jehovah Jireh. Your miracles in the midst of thorns. Your miracles in the behind the wall. Your miracles in the midst of problems. Hang on to Jehovah Jireh. The miracles in reserve. You know what I did, Brother Gurley? I got in for my nice, beautiful, sharp, looking 1976 Buick Riviera. I mean, this thing was a submarine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It had vinyl seats. Had a rip in it. Had a rust coming down one side where we tried to bondo it and didn't do a good job. There was a hole on my side of the door where you stick the key in to unlock the door. 
And so to unlock the door, you had to stick your finger in there and pull up on that rod. I got in that submarine. I started it up all the way to Texas Bible College. He is Jehovah Jireh. You see, when you're in the will of God and you're fulfilling the call of God, you don't have to worry about how nice your car is or how ugly it is. You're riding with Jehovah. I said you're riding with Jehovah. Don't compare yourselves among yourselves. Be thankful for... a beautifully prepared gourmet dish that is transformed by the fire of the oven to satisfy the appetites of its consumer. So the ingredients of ministry must bake in the oven of preparation. And can I tell you that to some of you now and those hereafter that Texas Bible College is that oven that will mix up the ingredients of faith, uh, that will mix up the ingredients, uh, amen, and lead you to the place that you need to be. Uh, you need to stay in the oven uh, until God is finished with you. Uh, you need to stay in the oven of baking uh, and the oven of fire until God is ready to serve you to a hungry world. foundation and I want to preach to you today. Can I? Can I? I know some of you got to go to work. That's all right. Amen. But I want and my desire today is to take the spoon of the Holy Ghost and start stirring the mixture of faith into your soul today. I want to tell you today that faith is the ingredient that dis disintegrates the gloom of insecurities. Faith is the ingredient that eliminates the paralysis of fear. Faith is the ingredient that will drive back the darkness of uncertainties and insecurities. You see, it was while protesting the idolatry of Ur and suffering persecution and enduring affliction that the God of glory appeared to Abraham and said, Get thee out. What? What? He started looking around for somebody. He started looking around for Daddy. Daddy, you trying to instruct me again? Hey, Abraham, this is your heavenly Daddy. Get thee out. And it was as though it were the first radiant day of sunshine after a midnight storm. A man and what Abraham had been feeling for years uh, had now finally arrived. It was the call of God on his life. A man as a child, he would think about it. He would feel it. He would listen to preachers preach. Uh, and he would probably say, uh, one day I'll be a preacher. One day, I'll be in the ministry, but patiently waiting as a child. He waited for that voice. He waited for that call. And now the time came. You see, it was when he was busy. It was when he was working. You cannot isolate yourself. You cannot close yourself in. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it, do it, do it with all of your might. And you'll hear the thundering voice of God say, get out. Get out. Get out of your country. Get out from your kindred. And he went a little bit further and said, Leave that out. Because I'm secure in Dad's house. He's got the money. He's provided my car. Abraham, if you want to fulfill the call of God, get out of Some of you are so fearful to leave mom and daddy. Some of you are shaking in your shoes because of an uncertain future. 
God called you to leave security and all you look into is the bleak darkness of uncertainty and you don't know how it's going to happen and you don't know how you're going to have what you need. Remember, he's Jehovah Jireh. If you'll leave daddy's house, he'll provide everything. The call of God. And now it wasn't Abraham that was waiting. It was God that was waiting. The call came and waited for faith to respond. And some of you, if you don't shake your emotional feelings, you're going to miss the will of God in your life. Because you cannot work off of what you feel. You've got to work off of faith. You may not understand how it's going to happen. But just know when his voice calls you, he's going to provide your every need. Feeling does not dictate the will of God. Faith. Faith has got to move in the will of God. Whether his voice thunders or whether his voice whispers, all other voices must dissipate and vanish at his hearing. His hearing. I was in my sophomore year of secular college. And let me preface this by saying absolutely no, I am not against secular college. No, of course not. Him, if you're called to the ministry and called to be at Texas Bible College and you're wasting time somewhere else. Come on. I was 20 years of age sitting in a sociology class. First I wanted to be a psychologist and I changed my mind to sociologist. Why? Because that is the way one person is affected by society as a whole. And I wanted to have an answer for the abortion problem. I wanted to have an answer for the drug problem. I wanted to know how to help these people. But it was when I was 20 years of age, my sophomore year of college, that I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when I got the Holy Ghost, my entire perspective on life changed. The way I looked at things were different. The way I felt about things were different. My mom didn't understand. My friends didn't understand. My family did not understand. But I did. I was sitting there, Brother Monson, in the sociology class. While I was sitting there, had my book open, the professor was teaching. We began to talk about a problem in society. All of a sudden, he began to give his reasoning and his answer to this problem. And something hit me like a ton of bricks. Tears came to my eyes in that sociology class that night. And the voice of God thundered in my soul. And he said, I've called you to preach my word. I said, what, God? He said, I have called you to preach my word. Immediately I felt fear. Immediately I said, God, I'm two years in the secular college. How is it going to work? This not, it was not even in my plans. You know what he said? Get the out. All right. That's all he needs to say when you're ready to do the will of God. He doesn't have to explain himself. He doesn't have to reason with you. All he needs to do is say, get out, get out, get out. I'm here to do the will of God. I'm here to do the will of God. Closed my sociology book and I said Texas Bible College here I come here I come here I come you know what the voice of the Lord is saying to some of you get out get out get out from your kindred get out from your home and get to Texas Bible College Only the heart and the ears of faith will understand what I'm about to say. Financial scholarships 
to major universities. Monetary gain and social status cannot compensate for the call and the will of God. Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Texas A&M, UT in Austin, University of Houston cannot compare to the call and the will of God. It is ridiculous and it is absurd to compare the temporal with the eternal. When God told you to do an eternal work, you got to leave from where you're at and get into the will of God and do the will of God. Yeah. Well, let's clap our hands to the Lord. An MD and a PhD does not even call, compare to a COG. You say, what in the world is a COG? The call of God. The call of God. The call of God. And the will of God. Don't compare it to the temple. Don't compare it to anything on the face of this earth. Lay out your treasures upon this earth where moth and dust are corrupt. But in heaven, you're called to do heavenly things. You with me? Can we keep going? Abraham, back to the pillow case. Looked out his window. Where are all these people coming from? What do they want? What are they saying? Abraham, where are you going? Let me just ask you one logical question. How are you going to live when you get there? Let me just reason with you for a moment. Son, Daughter, you're separating yourself from your family and from your lifelong relationships. What are you going to do about finances? And you immediately felt the loneliness of ministry. And sometimes you're going to feel very lonely doing the will of God and fulfilling the call of God in your life. Just because you don't feel good doesn't mean you're out of the will of God. It means that God is shaping and forming character into your life to lead and direct people in the future. Because what God does today is preparation for what he wants to do in your life tomorrow. Come on. That's why Joshua said on the banks of the Jordan, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord shall do wonders among you. You just do the natural today. Get yourself here as naturally as you can and let God take over and let the supernatural take over and let the miraculous take over in the will of God. He did not understand the anxiety. He didn't understand the fear that he was feeling because of an uncertain future. He couldn't explain it. He didn't have concrete answers to every question. He couldn't reason back with them. He couldn't just tell them, this is how it's going to happen, and this is how much money I'm going to have, and this is how it's all going to work out. Now, again, I believe in balance. I don't believe in reckless faith. But I do believe you've got to leave a margin for a miracle. Yeah. You see, he didn't have concrete answers. All he had was faith, but faith was all that he needed. You see, his faith was like that of Cortez. When Cortez landed upon the shores of Mexico, the first commandment to all of his men was turn around and burn every boat on the beaches. In other words, from here on out, it's either victory or it's death. Why did his men hurriedly burn every boat? 
because number one, they had faith in the call of war. Number two, they had faith in their captain. And number three, they had nothing to go back to. They didn't have a desire to turn around. Now I said that to say this, there are some of you sitting here today that have tied your boat and your bridge amen to the dock of the door of your dorm room and any little problem that comes your way you're ready to hop in and go back home and any little affliction that comes your way you're ready to retire and tie the rope and sail back home i've come to tell you today you need to take the fuel of faith and burn every bridge and burn every boat and say i'm here to do the will of god i'm not going home God called me here, and I'm staying. Yes. Burn it. Burn it. Burn it. Burn every temptation to turn around. Right. His faith was like that of James Calvert, who went out as a missionary to the cannibals of the Fiji Islands. And the captain of the ship called this man Calvert. He called to him and he summoned him to turn back. He said, you will lose your life and the life of those that are with you if you go among such savages, he cried. Calvert only replied, we died before we came here. If your faith has been minimized and shrink, amen, to what God will do for your future, you haven't died yet. God brought you to this place to die. God brought you to this place to die from going back to anything else. You need to anchor yourself at Texas Bible College and say, I'm not leaving. I'm not budging. I'm here to do the will of God. I died at an altar before I ever got here. His faith was like that of Christian in Pilgrim's Progress. His travel, Mount Zion. He came to the wicked gate. And the story goes, at last there came a grave person to the gate named Goodwill, who asked who was there, and whence he came, and what he would have. Christian replied, here is a poor, burdened sinner. I come from the city of destruction, but am going to Mount Zion, that I may be delivered from the wrath to come. I would, therefore, sir, since I am informed that by this gate is the way thither, know if you are I am willing with all of my heart, said he. And with that, he opened the gate. So when Christian was stepping in, the other gave a pull at him. And he said, Christian, what means that? The other told him, a little distance from this gate, there is erected a strong and mighty tower, of which Beelzebub is the capital. From thence both he and them that are with him shoot sharp arrows at those that come up to this gate. If haply they might die before they enter in. Then said Christian, I rejoice. And I tremble. So when he was got in, the man of the gate asked him who directed him thither. Evangelist, bid me come hither and knock. As I did, and he said that you, sir, would tell me what I must do. An open door is set before thee, Christian, and no man can shut it. Now I begin to reap the benefits of my hazards. But how, Christian, is it that you came alone? 
because none of my neighbors saw their danger as I saw mine. Did any of them know of your coming? Yes. My wife and my children saw me at first and called after me to turn again. Also, some of my neighbors stood crying and calling after me, but I put my fingers in my ear and so came on my way. But did none of them follow you to persuade you to go back? Yes, yes. Both obstinate and pliable. But when they saw that they could not prevail, obstinate went railing back, but pliable. A little way. But why did he not come through, Christian? We indeed came both together until we came at the slough of despond, into which we also suddenly fell. And then was my neighbor pliable discouraged and would not adventure further. Wherefore, getting out again on that side next to his own house, he told me that I should possess this land alone for him. He went his way, and I came mine. He, after obstinate, but I to this gate. Now to some of you, you will drown out the voice of God. But to others that are in this place today, you are standing at the gate of your calling. You are standing at the gate of the call of God. Amen. And friends are like pliable. They desire to share your dream. They desire to share your call. But even the nearest and even the dearest may depart from this journey. Faith keeps on marching. Faith keeps on walking. Faith keeps on believing. Faith keeps on journeying. Right. Emotional security, hear me, emotional security may be temporarily severed, but the love and the comfort of God will respond to that severing. Amen. And he will hedge in your calling and he will keep out the fear of the enemy. Amen. I want you to notice the first place that Abraham went to after he was called of God. The Bible said he went to the plain of Mori. The word plain means an oak or another strong tree, a mighty man. The word mori means to teach or a place of instruction. Sounds like there was Bible college right after he went and listened to the call of God. God led him to a place of instruction where he would be taught. And for those of you that think you only need one year of Bible college because you're so full of inspiration that you're going to set the world on fire, let me remind you of something. Inspiration without instruction leads to frustration. You need all three years. You need to get to the plain of Mori where God can teach you and God can instruct you. He led him to a place where the root system of his life would be embedded in the Word of God. He took him to a place where he would learn to stand against the winds of false doctrine. Amen. The winds of idolatry and weather the storm like a tall standing oak. He led him to a place where he would become a mighty man of God. He led him to a place where he would learn to exercise the muscles of his faith, his own faith, not mama's faith, and I'm coming to a close, not daddy's faith. Amen, amen. Let me tell you, you have felt the fear and the frustration, knowing that it's time to leave security and go into uncertainty. You have felt the spears of Beelzebub. You have heard the voices of your friends trying to turn you back from coming here. But may I submit to you today that the mount of God beckons your call. The mount of God beckons your service. And the shield of faith is awaiting you. Nobody can grip that shield like you can grip that shield. 
I said, nobody can do what God has called you to do. There are places that you're going to go that God will lead you. And only you will be able to reach them. Amen. Only you will be able to take that shield of faith and fight off all of the fiery darts of the enemy. Amen. I know that there is going to be hazards. There's going to be difficulties. There's going to be loneliness. But arm yourselves like militant men and fight the good fight of faith. Arm yourselves like militant ladies and fight Fight, fight the good fight of faith. Your faith then will become like the caterpillar that's transformed into the butterfly. You see, it is called metamorphosis. And the caterpillar goes through life inch by inch. what is called a cocoon. And this cocoon becomes a hardened case to hide them from the outer extremities of fear, to hide them from a world. And it's there that they become what scientists call pupae. And it is there that they are hidden from the world, not dead. No, they're very alive in the cocoon. But it's there during pupation that the structures of that caterpillar are totally transformed. In other words, internal systems are reorganized in a cocoon and adult external structures are developed and manifested. Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, when I became a man, I put childish things away. You see, Jesus Christ had to put him in the cocoon of transformation. Jesus Christ had to put him in the cocoon of calling. Jesus Christ had to put him in the cocoon of preparation, in the cocoon of instruction. That's why he was blinded. And for three days, blinded, dark, and desolate, he wrestled with the will of God. He wrestled with the call of God, pushing and struggling and forcing. Amen. Blind. But when the third day was over, suddenly that hardened case cracked open. You see, something was happening in the cocoon. The wings of faith were spreading. The wings of faith were sprouting. And when Paul got out, his eyes were open. The scales were moved. And he had a revelation of who Jesus Christ was. Hey, listen to me. I went to Bible college with people that in their freshman year, they could not tell me why we baptize in Jesus' name. Did you hear me? They could not tell me. They knew that we did baptize in Jesus' name, but they couldn't take me to Scripture to tell me why. They had no revelation of the truth. God put them in the cocoon of instruction at Bible college. God put them in the cocoon of preparation. Amen. And when they came out, they understood that great is the mystery. Great is the revelation of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. You see, when you get into this cocoon, doctrine's going to be born in you. When you get into this cocoon, truth is going to spread its wings and ready to fly to a city that needs truth, ready to fly to a world that needs truth. Now, I'm coming to a close. You wonder? why you've been feeling a transformation in the way that you think. You wonder why you have been feeling a transformation in the way that you feel and in the way that you believe. 
I'm telling you today, it's because you're in the cocoon of the call of God, about to fly to the will of God. You get tired of sitting in class. You get tired of the monotonous hours of study. You feel yourself pushing. You feel yourself pulling. You feel yourself stretching. You feel yourself strengthening. You feel yourself rolling. You feel yourself rumbling. You know what it is? Childish things are being put away. And God's putting some wings on you. You're about to come out of the cocoon. And God's saying to the senior class, get thee out. Get thee out. Don't sit on a pew somewhere. Preach. 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 Preach the word. Let's stand together. You're getting ready to fly. Do you hear me? Some of you are getting ready to fly. 